compliment the director of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's program, The Fictive Architecture of Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel by Duncan Story. Um, I want to personally thank the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation for its continued support for the library and museum's programming events and exhibits. We could not bring you the exhibits like this one without this and with that, I'm going to now introduce Lise Whitney, the Executive Director of the Foundation, to introduce tonight's speaker. Okay. Thanks, Brooke, as always. Uh, Brooke mentioned the team that we have between the Foundation and the uh, Library and, and the Museum, and we're just thrilled to be able to work together. We are doing great things together. Well, I want to uh, thank all of you for being here. You, know, you came into a museum where we see so much about the, the, the tragedy of the human condition uh, in great art, but also we see the response to tragedy, the triumph, the possibilities of triumph in the human condition. And for the triumph of pulling off a great event this evening and all the staff who made that possible, other individuals, I'd like to just take a moment to Thank uh, you, our friends of Ford, who are here this evening, for all of your support year in and year out and through a very tough pandemic. Thanks for, uh, for sticking with us. Uh, members of the Ford family who are here, uh, we've got Karen and, and Bob Ford. Thanks for uh, representing the Fords uh, here. Uh, we have trustees and former trustees. We have Mark Murray, for example. I think we have David Hooker with us in the audience of the Ford Foundation. And our partner, Martin Bialis and SCE, the Special Entertainment Events of Los Angeles, have brought and pulled together the Sistine Chapel images that you see, 40 some odd images, and brought them into this, this space. Our good partners, of course, at the Ford Presidential Museum, Brooke and her team, thank you. And uh, my terrific team at the, uh, at the Ford Presidential Foundation. I especially want to give a shout out to Lauren, who did so much working with Kristen over the museum site to pull all of this together. So, Let's give them all a hand. We're so grateful that you're here for week three. This is week three of our Sistine Chapel Evenings to Remember. And it's significant because you are here helping us build a community. A community of, that represents President and Mrs. Ford's virtues and their values. So by your supporting this event, you're supporting something much larger and more significant. It's significant because President and Mrs. Ford themselves lived in one of the most famous uh, museums, art museums in the world. The White House has all kinds of beautiful paintings and sculpture. Uh, they were there in the White House in the 70s, as you know, for 895 days, and they were ambassadors for the art that was there. So President and Mrs. Ford were very tuned into art. And then you have, um, I think another significance is the fact that President Ford, within his first year of office, went to Rome, and he met with Pope Paul VI, and they had a quite a deep talk about what was in the West, what was in Western civilization that was worth preserving. And as the values, again, the virtues that we're talking about that were so important to the civilization. So you have you know, this, this discussion about the freedom of expression, the freedom to be able to express transcendent truth, goodness, and beauty in works of art. And that's what this is about. When you go through this magnificent exhibit, you will see examples of expressions of transcendent truth, goodness, and beauty. Uh, it's also significant because of this evening's distinguished speaker, Duncan Strike. We feel very fortunate to have Duncan. Uh, he promises to deepen our understanding of the images, and especially we're looking at a, the greatest symbiosis of art and architecture on the planet. So he's going to unpack what that means for us a bit. Duncan is a practicing architect, author, and professor of architecture at Notre Dame. His award-winning work can be found all over the United States. I've been familiarizing myself with, with some of it. It's in La Crosse, uh, La Crosse Wisconsin. It's in Baltimore. Uh, it's in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And if you want a little field trip to see his work directly, there are two pieces of of architecture here that you should go drive, just get in the car and drive down to Hillsdale to the Hillsdale Chapel, Christ Chapel there, a magnificent example of his architecture. 
and then what he did with the Kalamazoo Cathedral uh, just down the road is also a good example of his, his vision as an architect, his work. He's a frequent lecturer on sacred architecture, and he's written, he's written a book, a beautiful book. I, I prize this book. It's a treasure. It's this church building as a sacred place, beauty, transcendence, and the eternal. And there you'll get his vision of what a recovery of sacred architecture might look like. And he also uh, has a journal that's quite stunning in itself, Sacred Architecture. Uh, this is the most recent edition, I believe, and uh, it's got some beautiful things. Baltimore, for example, the cathedral there. So he really is a, is a polymath. He's, uh, he's, he's able to, to communicate the values we're going to be talking about this evening in a, in a lot of ways. He went to the University of Virginia. Uh, he uh, went to uh, Yale uh, School of Architecture. Uh, was uh, has won a number of awards, the 2016 winner of the Arthur Ross Award for Architecture. In 2019, he was appointed to the U.S. Commission of Fine Arts. And you can read more about his biography in the program. What I want to emphasize before I get off this stage is, you know, he has this impressive resume, but what is really interesting is the spirit behind the man who is leading a small cadre of architects had this vision back in the 80s and 90s, he has been leading really an international movement to recover classicism in our civilization and all that that means. You know, we've lost so many because of modernity and post-modernity, we've lost so many of the forms that humanize and that tie us to previous generations. But he's leading that effort, a growing effort, uh, I'm pleased to say. So he, he really has a, a vision that, that's just great. And this evening he's going to be speaking as Brooke mentioned it about the fictive architecture of Michelangelo and the Sistine Chapel. So with that, are you ready to learn? Yes. What? What? Are you ready to learn? Yes. Okay, then help welcome Dr. Stroy. Doesn't he? Well, it's an honor to be here, uh, Grand Rapids. Do any of you ever take your boat from here to the Big Body Board? I love that Grand River. I love that. Oh, yeah, I think that's good. I love Grand Haven. It's great to be at the Rapids. And uh, it's so stunning that you brought uh, Michelangelo to Grand Rapids. And I'm honored to be here and try to share a few thoughts about. Um, this prince. Now, when you think of uh, Michelangelo Buonarroti, what comes to mind? What do you think of? You think of the Sistine Chapel, yeah. Um, and he was, he was a, unlike me, he was a true polymath, uh, architect, painter, sculptor, and not a bad poet. Um, so I'd like to share a few thoughts. As an architect, I'm speaking tonight, not as an art, art historian. So. Um, but I hope that you'll see the art or, or see the connection to it. Um, when you think of the most famous room and the most famous art in the world, what do you think of? When, who's been there? Okay, you guys and Gerald Ford. So I, I was assuming that he had been there. I was assuming that he and Betty had been there and Gleaves just answered it. And I wanted to say that we're gonna, in his honor, in Gerald Ford's honor, we're gonna go back and uh, visit it. But um, when you think of the building with this great art, or the room, I'd say the room, you know, one room with most, the greatest room in the world with the, mo with the greatest art, uh, you don't talk, think a lot about the architecture. And you know, that's fine. As someone who's a classical architect and I design buildings, usually uh, public buildings and often for worship, I would be fine with that. But you don't notice the architecture, but you notice the art. Because the art, if it's beautiful art, if it's figurative, it has a way to bring us into contact with the divine more than anything, maybe other than music, right? So it's the art that we can relate to we who are created in God's image, and then the art should speak of God. And uh, people did call him 
Il Divino Michelangelo because many have felt that he did that uh, as well as or better than anyone. So we don't think a lot about the architecture of the Sistine Chapel, but I'm an architect, so what else can I talk about? Um, though he was the prince of Renaissance artists, Michelangelo derived his painted architecture from the architecture of the room. The proportions and dimensions of the room were carried up into the ceiling and create a frame for the multiple narratives of creation and Christ's forebears. While he has little architecture within the landscapes of his paintings, when you think of all those paintings on the ceiling or the sibyls or we have all these great sibyls and prophets and, and so on, you don't think a lot about they're in, a, they're in a landscape or they're in a cityscape or there's buildings behind them. But the ceiling itself is architectural and it's all fictive. It's architectural and it's fictive. The framing of the nine main panels, which are the story of creation and the fall, and the other figures have very strong architectural elements, even stronger than the architecture that's below them, where you frame the paintings of the other great artists like Botticelli and Perugino. Michelangelo derived his design directly from the windows, the cornices, and the pilasters of the original chapel. But as he was wont to do, Michelangelo modified the architecture, made it more complex, and on one wall he even removed it. Do you know which wall he removed it on? That being said, his paintings and his architecture reflect the existing architecture of the room and help to intensify it with this fictive architecture on the ceiling. So, where is the Sistine Chapel? Do you know where it is in this picture? It's on the right, good. So, it's actually a building that you can't see from the piazza today, although at one time you could have when it was first built and for about, uh, maybe for a hundred years. Um, but it's, it's this building right back here. It's a tall building, but again, it's, uh, from the, if you were in the piazza, it's blocked by this beautiful facade and this colonnade and the, and the beginning of the court of San Damaso, which is the beginning of the Vatican apartments and the Vatican Museum. So we have to get up high to see it. Now it's an interesting vantage point to talk about Michelangelo and the Sistine Chapel because you can't really see what Michelangelo did at the Sistine from up here. It's all inside. But there's other things that you can see because what else did Michelangelo do in this picture? He's credited for being the genius behind the Dome of St. Peter's. He's credited for being the second genius behind the plan of St. Peter's. And even though St. Peter's, unlike the Gothic cathedrals, took hundreds of years to build. Did you hear what I just said? Unlike the Gothic cathedrals? St. Peter's actually took 160 years to build. Michelangelo gets, uh, gets credited with the idea for this great dome. There's, there's another good view of the dome and the Sistine Chapel, looking down on it. So one of the things that's interesting about it, of course, it's a chapel. It's a room for prayer. It's also a room for meetings uh, for the Pope and others. Today it's a museum uh, that millions of people visit. Um, and you see it here. It's connected to the Vatican uh, Palace, which is apartments and offices and, and so on. And it's right next to the main church where um, the, uh, the Prince of the Apostles uh, the fisherman, St. Peter, is buried right under there, right? So it's right in this crux between the living area and the, this, this greatest of, of, of churches, the greatest of Western temples. And that's how to think about it, that it's connected to both of these buildings. Does that make sense? It's a chapel connected to the house and connected to the cathedral, as it were. Here's, the, here's a view of the outside. Uh, it's a four-story building 
Uh, the room that we focus on, the greatest room in the world, uh, is on the third floor. And you're looking at, you're looking at here the windows, which are up high. So the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel is somewhere in here. There's the windows, and the floor is down here somewhere. And then there's two more floors below that. Um, if you've ever gone there, it seems like kind of going through a rabbit warren to get there because they want you to go in and miss, you know, the Pope is doing something, so you've got to walk around him. And, no, I'm kidding, but there, 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 is a, there is kind of a convoluted path to get there, which is not the way it's intended to be if you were a cardinal or a, or a, a bishop or someone visiting the Pope. Um, I believe this building on the back is the sacristy um, with its big windows. And you see there's a big room on the top and so on. So it's just interesting to talk about this um, building from the outside. You notice on the outside it has, a, a, it's a very beautiful building. Not really. It's a very simple building. It's of its time. Um, and it has, um, it has what used to be really uh, uh, this, this kind of... Um, cantilever here, and this crenellation, what does it make you think of? Peace or? Yeah, this is a building that needed, it's up high, and has a place for the bowmen and others to defend the Pope uh, from invasion. And of course, um, uh, you know, there's never fighting in the Vatican. Um, the emperor never, uh, never invaded or anything like that. So, um, now this is the plan of um, the chapel next to the original St. Peter's. So what we call Old St. Peter's, built by who? Constantine, Emperor Constantine, the first Christian emperor. So this is the, this is the, this is the church that he built over the tomb of St. Peter. And you can see it's a, a basilica type with colonies or columns, colonnades. And uh, it's added onto as a courtyard. And then the chapel's right here. So that's what you have to understand. So, um, the Sistine was the place for the papal household, up to 200 people, to gather for prayer with the Pope. They would do this about 40 times a year. 40 times a year. So where does the Pope go the rest of the time? I think he sleeps in. <laughs> no, the Pope has to say Mass every day, or he did in the good old days, and so... There are a series of very small chapels where the Pope would say more of a private mass or small group. And then, of course, St. Peter's gets used. But in, in the Middle Ages um, and in the early Renaissance, probably just a handful of times. Of course, the Pope can use it whenever he wants, but the Pope is actually in St. Peter's for a liturgy only a few times. I don't know, five, ten times. I think there was three times he had to be there. And so not that many times. So, the Sistine was kind of the intermediary chapel, the place where you could get a lot of people in there, probably 300, 400 people, so kind of like the crowd tonight. And uh, you, you know, and, and you can have uh, a liturgy or you can have another kind of event. Um, and then St. Peter's is the church for, you know, probably before pews were invented, probably 10,000 people, and after pews were invented, probably, we don't have pews, but seats, you know, probably 10,000 people. Um, so here you have a view of, of the Sistine Chapel and kind of filled up and being used. Um, so for papal masses, the Sistine needed a sanctuary for the altar. You can see that at the end, a chair for the Pope off to the left, seating around the walls, and a choir loft for the Coro della Cappella Musicale Pontificia Sistina. So the famous Sistine Chapel, uh, they called the Sistine Ch Chapel, right? The Capella Sistina. Um, who were in, here's, here's the Pope, and here's their choir loft. Famous for music, and uh, particularly known in the beginning when it was founded, 1480s, by Joaquin de Pre. And then um, you may know, have heard of a fellow named Palestrina. He was a, he was a short time member of the uh, choir. Many members of the papal household sat on the stairs kind of like sitting where you are tonight, right? See all those people sitting on stairs? Those are grown men sitting on those stairs. <clears throat> They've been working out probably. Um, so, um, and then one of the few remaining barriers, uh, liturgical barriers remaining in a Roman church, 
many of the churches in Europe would have had altar screens, chancel screens like this, rood screens, uh, but they were taken out before the Reformation and after the Reformation, in some cases destroyed. But this, uh, one of the things that's interesting about the Sistine is it still has a beautiful marble uh, uh, root screen or chancel screen. And then what you don't see in this image is the ceiling, which is a barrel vault. It's a vaulted ceiling. So that's what the Sistine Chapel had. That's what it needed. And it's all about serving the papal life and uh, the papal masses. Um, and then this is, uh, this is the building before the Sistine Chapel, and you get a sense of uh, St. Peter's, the edge of St. Peter's is here, and there is a chapel there. This is the chapel before the Sistine Chapel. Now we call it the Sistine Chapel, why? Because it was, uh, the, the Pope was 16 years old when he built it. Why do we call it the Sistine Chapel? Sixtus IV, that was the Pope, Pope Sixtus IV, and he built the chapel because he wanted a chapel named after himself, Sistine. No, uh, the, the name, it became called the Sistine Chapel uh, later on, after his death. Uh, but Sixtus IV uh, wanted to build it to, to replace the chapel that had been there with the, uh, what they called the Capella Magna. That's like a, uh, a student who does very well in school, a Capella Magna, and, um, which is uh, another term for great chapel. This was the great chapel, right? Uh, and this was built by Innocent III in 1298. In fact, the Sistine Chapel is built on the foundations of the old chapel and is the same size in plan. It has some irregularities from the Middle Ages. One of the walls is not perpendicular to the other. Our understanding is this great chapel had become decrepit over the centuries. And so by the time of Sixtus IV, in the 1570s, sorry, 1470s, 1470s, um, uh, a little bit before that Columbus guy who founded Ohio, uh, 1470s, uh, he uh, uh, wanted to rebuild the chapel and build it bigger and better, um, and so on. Here you see uh, a painting of the liturgy in the earlier chapel in the pre, the, the Capella Magna, before Sixtus IV, and you see the high altar, you see an image of the uh, Virgin, you see the Pope sitting under a canopy, uh, you see people sitting around, those are all uh, cardinals, and you see people sitting on the floor in beanbag chairs. Um, I think this was the 1970s or the 1470s, something like that. Okay, um, now, um, so, so that was the uh, 1298, the, the big chapel at St. Peter's. Now there's a time when the weather wasn't so nice in Italy and um, the popes decided to stay in their summer house in Avignon. And Pope Clement, that's a joke, Pope Clement VI built a second Capella Magna, or a great chapel for the papal household while the popes were in Avignon, France, which was about 70 years. And this is presumably in memory of that church in Rome, um, because it's so similar in size. Now this chapel, has anybody been to Avignon? Oh, very good. Sur le pont, Avignon. Um, yes, one of my favorites. Um, now it was a Gothic chapel built with stone vaulting, 1348, so about 50 years after the, uh, the first chapel in Rome, but larger, slightly larger than the one at the Vatican. Uh, dimensions were 48 feet wide, remember this, 48 feet wide by 160 feet long by 62 feet high. Now when you hear 48 by 160, what do you think proportionally? 48, 160, like one to three, right? 48 by 160, a little bit bigger than one to three. That's what I want you to remember. And then 62 feet high is uh, a little bit taller than that. Now, the Avignon, does this look like a cathedral to you? No, no, it's not, it's just a chapel. 
Uh, it's a nice chapel. It has no side aisles, has no side chapels. It's fairly simple. Now, interestingly, it had, uh, it had room for 200. It had a root screen down the middle, in the middle. Uh, to, and the root screen is to separate the lay people from the uh, priests and the and cardinals. And it had um, painted tapestries along the wall. Isn't that interesting? Why would anybody paint them on? How does that keep us warm? Painted tapestries on the wall, on the lower walls. Um, and then I said that the Sistine in Rome by Pope Sixtus is slightly smaller. It is 44 wide instead of 48, 134 feet long instead of 160, and 68 feet tall. So again, proportionally, 44, 134, still about a one to three proportion. So the proportion very similar. So you build a chapel in Rome, you go to Avignon uh, for a vacation, you build another chapel, a little bit bigger, Gothic, stone, then you come back to Rome. What are you gonna do? You're gonna build, again, something similar. Okay, here he is. Now, do, do you know who's, uh, do you know Sixtus IV? Have you heard of him? A few people? Um, he was a Franciscan, and he was an outstanding humanist. He was famous as a theologian who wrote on the Immaculate Conception. The conception of the Mother of God. He was a great patron of art and architecture in Rome, and he founded the Biblioteca Vaticana. It's a fancy name for a library, and the first public museum at the Capitoline Hill. So he's a library and museum founder. Um, he restored hospitals, and he built a series of churches dedicated to the Virgin Mary. Now, previous popes had begun to renovate St. Peter's because it was in bad shape. <clears throat> it was only about 1,100 years old. I don't see what the big deal is. Just patch the roof and keep going. Um, but in fact, some of the walls, which were thick, were actually leaning by a couple of feet. It was kind of, you could see. And things were starting to come undone at the roof. And it's a lot of worry. And you know, bricks would fall down and kill people. So they'd start getting worried about those things. They didn't have lawyers or insurance companies in those days, so it wasn't that bad. But, um, but no, it was getting a little scary. So earlier popes, uh, after Avignon, started thinking about fixing up St. Peter's and rebuilding it. Or not really rebuilding, fixing up. They're really just trying to fix it up. Now, Sixtus came in, and he, uh, being this great theologian, Franciscan theologian, he wanted to build a chapel to the Immaculate Conception behind the altar uh, where St. Peter is buried. And then he wanted to rebuild the Sistine Chapel, and he dedicated that also to the Mother of God, to the Assumption, okay? So Franciscan building two kind of chapels right at St. Peter's, both dedicated to the Virgin Mary, okay? Now here's old St. Peter's. This is a, you know, a reconstruction. We, it's a pretty good reconstruction, but you see the, you see the Constantinian Basilica, which is uh, the largest, well, with St. John Lateran, the largest church in the world, and uh, the um, transept, and this beautiful um, uh, courtyard or atrium, and uh, front facade, and various things have been added on. Things are tombs and other uh, things are added on. And here's the papal, the towers added later. Uh, people, they didn't have bells in the time of the ancient Romans. That was illegal. But then uh, you see the Sistine Chapel is one of the things that gets built um, on that old foundation of a church um, in the 1570s. And this is what it looked like originally, kind of like today, although it's grown in height. But it was uh, parallel with St. Peter's in the same direction. And like St. Peter's, it had the altar, it was backwards. What do I mean it was backwards, like St. Peter's? Who knows what backwards means? In its orientation. Yes, so St. Peter's, uh, they didn't know that they should, Constantine and his uh, architects weren't very smart, so they put it backwards, like most of the churches in Rome. 
Um, so the altar is in the west. And uh, of course, that was forwards at that time. And uh, was facing, it was really, um, yeah. So, uh, and, and the Sistine Chapel, which is built a thousand years later, is also facing the same direction backwards. For those of you who like to put altars in the east, I say that for your sake. It's backwards. Okay. Um, now, there are two architects associated with the Sistine Chapel. Uh, and one is Baccio Pontelli, who owns the company that makes the chocolates. And the other is Giovanna, Giovanni De Dolci, who also has a sweet tooth. Now, the Sistine Chapel was built in eight years from 1473 to 1481, and there was a plan to fully decorate it with the best artists uh, that, that, you could, that you could find, and those tended to be from that other town. Florence. The design of the architecture helped to determine the layout of the paintings by Perugino, Botticelli, Ghirlandaio, and Signorelli. The ceiling with its lunettes intersecting the barrel hole uh, were considered the heavens, the heavenly constellations which were painted by another artist, Pier Matteo D'Amelia. And so he painted this blue ceiling, beautiful azure ceiling with the constellations which were symbolized by the stars. The architecture and the composition of the paintings also influenced the later composition of the ceiling by Michelangelo and the tapestries by Raphael. There you get a, a view of what the Sistine ceiling was before uh, Michelangelo came along, right? Beautiful blue ceiling. It's hard to see, but the gold stars and the constellations, it's a very nice ceiling, actually fairly expensive. Um, now, what was it inspired by? Um, lots of great fresco churches uh, in the Middle Ages and then in the Renaissance. And these are three that are kind of close by and they, uh, uh, they have some connections to Rome. The first is the uh, Capella Scrobeni in Padova. Do you know that on the left? Um, by Giotto. Uh, considered the first Renaissance artist. And you can see uh, this great, this, this chapel, uh, and we're looking at the doorway, with a series of stories along the walls divided up by architecture, and then a ceiling with blue and gold stars. Sound familiar? Now one thing I'd like to point out at Scrobeni is, can you tell what that is over the front door? Anybody make out? Hard to see, okay. It's a last judgment over the front door. And that is a classic type in the Middle Ages. The Franciscans would do it, to use a, a last judgment somewhere, and uh, over the door would be, as you're leaving church, to be aware of that. So, uh, and then on the bottom right, I'm just showing you the ceiling of the, um, the Oratory of San Giorgio, also in uh, also in Padova uh, by uh, less well-known artists. So that was Giotto. This is Jacopo da Vanzi and Sebito da Verona. That's 1384. And then the one on the top right is the Nicoline Chapel, the Capella Nicoline, with an E, uh, by Frangelico. You may have heard of him, 1451. So this, this one on the top right um, gives you a sense of what's happening before Sixtus comes along to rebuild. 20 years, 25 years before Sixtus rebuilds the church. Again, uh, there's an altar, there's a base, there's some doors, there's a stories, um, uh, there's a vaulted ceiling, and it's really uh, a room, a beautiful marble floor, cosmetic floor. So these, these are some of the buildings and others that may have influenced Sixtus in doing the Sistine Chapel, this chapel dedicated to the Assumption. Now the room has four levels, and these levels get smaller as they ascend. The first level is 19 feet tall, 
includes the painted tapestries and built-in benches at the base. Again, something that we've heard of in Avignon. It also imitates the Sancta Sanctorum at the Cathedral of St. John Lateran in Rome. So this idea of painted tapestries at the base. So that was 19 feet tall. Second level is the main level of paintings that were done under the uh, patronage of Sixtus is the life of Christ on one side and the life of Moses on the other side. And they are 15 feet tall. And all four painters from Florence were involved in these uh, paintings. The third level is an interesting one of, the, uh, of 32 canonized popes, popes that were saints. Uh, in most cases, they were saints because why? Martyrdom, martyrdom, they were martyred. Uh, how many of the first popes were martyred? Does anybody know? All of them, yeah, all the first ones were martyred. But anyway, 32, 32 of the early uh, popes, and I think most of them were martyred. And then um, that, is, uh, that is 14 feet tall, so 19, 15, 14. And then um, the, the, the top area, which we call the lunettes, before the ceiling, the lunettes um, above the arches, uh, those uh, were painted actually later by Michelangelo and the Four Bears of Christ, and they were about eight feet, uh, that's not right. something like that, eight, eight or ten feet. So if you then include the ceiling, you get the, you get the room to 68 feet. So again, I say this is a four-story interior, 68 feet tall, four stories with different levels, tapestries, Christ and Moses, popes, and then the work of Michelangelo starts the four bears of Christ and then the, the great ceiling. Does that make sense? Now, on special feast days, those wonderful painted tapestries get covered by real tapestries. And this was done after Sixtus and after Julius and after Michelangelo's first project there, his first job in Rome. Um, and, and this is uh, Raphael doing, uh, doing uh, tapestries, the life of Peter and Paul uh, from the Acts of the Apostles on the lower level. So kind of stunning. When you think about that room at our level, tapestries of Peter and Paul, they don't come get brought out much to these days. And then Life of Christ and Moses, uh, the next step, and then the bishops of Rome, the popes above that. So this shows you the four walls. And what I want to emphasize here are the horizontal cornices. Now, what's interesting about these cornices, here's one, you know, they define the levels, right? One, two, three, and then we have the lunettes and the ceiling. Um, they help to define how tall these tapestries could be or how big these paintings could be or so on and so forth. These are big tapestries, these are big paintings. And some of these cornices are real and some are painted. And then the pilasters, do you know that term pilaster? It's like a square column in, in, engaged to the wall. It's not married yet, it's still engaged. An engaged column. Um, uh, uh, the, these uh, pilasters and uh, cornices are painted. Some, some is painted, some is real, some is fictive. I like that word, it sounds very expensive. Fictive, some are fictive and some are real. Um, we would say virtual, some are virtual. Um, but these help to define the pattern or the module or the dimensions of the artwork that's gonna go there. So they're determined first. They're the frame for the artwork. Now the pilasters are centered on the walls in between the windows. And because we have windows on each side, that is six windows on each side, 
and two windows on the ends. This gives us 16 windows, which gives us 16 pilasters on three levels. This in turn determines that we get 16 tapestries and 16 panels of the life of Christ and of Moses. You follow that a little bit? Six windows. The six windows are determining the pilasters. The pilasters are determining the paintings. The paintings are determining the tapestries and so on and so forth. Michelangelo has to grapple with that. It also determines that we're going to have two popes on each side of a window, so we have 32 canonized popes and not 33 or 37 or whatever. Right? So the number is important. So the room had has an effect on all of this. It's a little fuzzy, isn't it? Most importantly, we understand that the narratives began at the altar. I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead. Most importantly, we, we realize that the uh, narratives began at the altar and proceed towards the entrance door. So. It's not that when we come in and it starts, the story starts, the story starts at the altar, which is ahead of us. So the story is Moses on the left and Christ on the right. So what do you start with, with Christ? Yes, the nativity. So originally there was a painting of the nativity on that wall, that big wall. And for Moses, when we think of the beginning of Moses' life, what do you think of? Yeah, the, the reeds, the bulrushes, being, being found in the water. So the two kind of nativity baby stories start out, okay? And then the story starts at the altar and then comes back. Does that make sense? And there's kind of a symmetry between Christ and Moses because Moses is a precursor of Christ and then Christ is kind of a second Moses, right? All right. On the first level, the entrance doorway is on the east wall with the two final paintings in the life of Christ and of Moses. Can you see that resurrection on the left? That's the final paintings. The altar and the altarpiece at the time of Sixtus were on the west wall. The fresco above the altar was by Pietro Perugino and was the Assumption. And we know that's the name of the chapel. So this is a reconstruction of what the end wall originally looked like. Right? Nativity, bull rushes. And then we have the story of Peter and Paul at the lower level if you bring in the tapestries. So this is the way it originally looked. And of course the cornices continued and there's pilasters here and there's the popes above and there's windows above and so on. Does that make sense? A little bit? And this is the guy. Do you know Perugino? Who is he the, the great teacher of? Pietro Perugino. The other guy. The other guy. Raphael. Uh, we think of Raphael as being a student or uh, very influenced by Perugino. Of course, Raphael uh, exceeds his, his master, but Perugino really taught him. This looks a little Raphael-esque to me. But this is, um, this is the type of painting that was on the wall originally in the Sistine Chapel. Okay. So this is a photo from a true uh, movie about the Sistine Chapel, Agony and the Ecstasy. I kind of like it, actually. But you get some great uh, video images of what it looked like before uh, Michelangelo got to work. So all of this, and then came, then came Pope Julius II, nephew of Sixtus, another Franciscan, and he wanted to further beautify this important papal chapel. He felt the need to totally redo the ceiling, due in part to the fact 
that in 1504, a large crack had developed right down the middle of the bowl and put a gash in the heavenly ceiling with its stars. Now one of the questions is, why would this building that's so well built by Baccio and Dolce, sounds like a clothing store, Baccio and Dolce, why would it have a crack? Well, it turns out that Saint, that, uh, that the Sistine Chapel is built in a part of the Vatican Hill that's particularly low and may have some other uh, structural uh, issues. And so it's the wall facing St. Peter's that had the most problems and led to the cracking of the ceiling. And that's also the same direction, do you remember, where St. Peter's wall is leaning. So the space between the Sistine Chapel and St. Peter's has not been a good place for um, uh, contractors. If they had had a 500-year warranty on this building, it would have been a problem. Okay. Now, what about the geometry of the architecture? This is a beautiful drawing of the plan of uh, the Sistine, and you see the area for us, for the laity, with these beautiful circles, and originally the rood screen or chancel screen was right here. Originally, so that's kind of the public, the more public area. Then you have a screen, and this was the area for the papal household, for the 200 uh, closest friends of the Pope. Okay, and uh, there you see a section through it too. So what's interesting about this? We talked a little bit about the overall proportions of the plan, one to three. Now, if you take the dimensions of the room, which is 44, divide that in half, that's, and you. You take the 22, it actually works out pretty, pretty well as a modular, modular uh, kind of plan. Forty-four by one thirty-four by sixty-eight. So we get um, basically two by six. And two by six as a fraction is equal to one to three, and it's 22 feet as the module. That's an important thing because that's where the pilasters are. The windows are between that. The space between each window, uh, or the space centered between each window would be 22 feet. So the 22 foot is worth knowing about. I'm not saying it's somehow symbolic or you know, in a Masonic way or something like that, but it's crucial to the design of the room and crucial to the size of the paintings and the tapestries that uh, Perugino, Botticelli, and company did, and then Raphael. And then Michelangelo has to deal with that. He has to decide what he's going to do. Uh, so 2 by 6, which is 12, and then the, uh, the height is 2 by 3, which is 6. So 6 to 12. Now if we go kind of take the whole cubic volume, think about the whole cube, you've got 6 to 12, that's kind of 2 cubes, right? Both long and six high. It's two cubes, so it's a, a room of two cubes. That's different than the Rubik's cube, but it's a cube anyways. This is a fun little drawing because you see the papal conclave, the cardinals meeting to elect a new pope, and you see the little white smoke coming out of the chimney that they erect temporarily. That's a temporary chimney. It's not meant to stay warm. Um, but the, the two cubes. So it's a, it's a very simple geometry of the room and a very logical, kind of rational kind of uh, layout. And then the architecture of Sixtus the fourth and his artist reflects that. That's what I'm trying to say. I think it's all part of that. Now, this understanding of the architecture of the room and its geometry brings us to our hero, Michelangelo Buonarroti and the ceiling. Just as the earlier artwork of the life of Moses and Christ set the stage for Michelangelo's frescoes of the creation and the Old Testament above, so the geometry of the room, its horizontal and vertical members, directed his painting of the ceiling architecture. I'm going over time, aren't I? Just as some of the pilasters and cornices of the wall are painted or fictive, so is all of Michelangelo's architecture. So I don't want you to look at all these beautiful people here. You can go out to the exhibit, but just try to try to look at the architecture. It's really hard, isn't it? These are amazing figures. 
in all different uh, shapes, at all different um, poses. Uh, but this, of course, is the creation of somebody. And um, a beautiful, uh, this is a central, central painting, actually, of the ceiling. And again, this idea of a painted ceiling comes out of a strong medieval tradition, early Renaissance tradition that Michelangelo is aware of. And um, so uh, Julius II makes him an offer he can't refuse. And uh, they're both strong gents. Uh, in spite of what we're told about Michelangelo, he was kind of a cheapskate. He lived a very frugal life, but he uh, was paid better than any other artist on the planet when he did this ceiling. And that's at 31 years old. So he was already a hot shot and he got well paid for it. It was a hard life, that being said. Uh, the, the Pope was a, a tough uh, uh, master, but... So, here's, here's, the, here's the room uh, with all these beautiful paintings and the architecture and the windows uh, and the rude screen uh, when Michelangelo gets to it. And the Pope asks him for just a slightly nicer, you know, more decorative ceiling. Um, uh, that with 12 apostles. He's really looking for a ceiling of 12 apostles. And we don't really have a design for that because it never happened. Because Michelangelo uh, told the Pope that he thought that would turn out to be a bad thing, a poor thing, sorry. 12 apostles would be a poor thing. And instead, he was given permission to do what I liked. That's what all architects and artists want to be told. Just do what you want. Come on, doesn't matter. <laughs> well, he had a pretty good track record, and uh, the Pope trusted him. And probably, I believe, I'm one of those people that believe there was a theologian involved that was, uh, you know, helped him with all this. And uh, and the Pope was a pretty good theologian, so may, might have been, he was certainly involved. But at any rate, um, But his original designs for the ceiling are reflective of these medieval and Renaissance ceilings, which divide the ceiling up into geometric patterns or panels. Okay, that's the first sketch. And this is Michelangelo. This is brilliant, but it relates to some other ceilings at the time where you divide the ceiling up into squares and circles and rectangles in a different, uh, uh, mainly a pattern running down the middle, and uh, th those would have the stories in them, or the figures, or the saints, or whatever, okay? So that's, that's the early sketch. Um, number two, and you see on the left, his kind of fuzzy sketch that he did, uh, was he starts emphasizing the central ones, and he makes them octagonal, he makes them big. The big ones, do you notice where the big ones are? What are they in front of? The big, the big paintings on the walls, on the side walls, the windows, yeah. So over the windows, which have the lunettes, that's where you put the big painting, and then in between you have the small paintings. So that's, that's an early idea that he's exploring, and um, then this is the third design, which we still execute. So it's, he did three designs, and this is the one he finally hit on, and there's some relations to all of them. Uh, he was always thinking about the um, um, the uh, sibyls, what's a sibyl? Prophetess, and then the prophets and the sibyls. He was always thinking about them surrounding the ceiling, and uh, then the stories in the middle uh, may have evolved, but every square inch is covered. Um, but he takes that idea that we just saw, and this is not as good as I would have hoped. I'm sorry, guys. Um, and. Uh, he alternates the size of the images. All right. And that's a comp composition of the wall with the ceiling above. So I want to talk about that, how the wall and the paintings below influence Michelangelo's ceiling above. He takes the geometry of the wall below and continues it up to the ceiling. Not exactly, because he's got a problem. The ceiling vaults on all four sides. And because of that, he can't put panels in front of all the windows. 
So what he does, he could only have four big panels. If he followed the uh, Perugino and Botticelli down below, he could only have four. So he says, oh, four's not enough. I gotta tell the story of creation, of the fall, of the, of, of the flood. I've gotta do all that. And so he finds a way to get nine panels in the ceiling. The guys below, they have how many? They have six, six windows, six paintings, six tapestries. Michelangelo finds a way to get nine. Okay, I'm talking about the central images, he gets nine. And then, um, of course, then he fits in the prophets and the sibyls, and uh, he gets uh, the family members of Christ. And then just because um, he's feeling generous, he paints another 50 paintings of new men. You know, like that. <laughs> just because you, you, you asked for it, you know, just fit that in. So a um, couple hundred figures in one little ceiling. There's another amazing view as you look up. Uh, now, the main panels of Michelangelo's work are like the creation, see the creation of Adam, or the, um, the, uh, the um, tasting of the fruit and the leaving of Eden. Um, those are 8 by 15, 8 feet by 15. So kind of small, right? 8 feet by 15 feet. That's about what this screen is. So each of those on the ceiling is about what this screen is, right? And then the little ones, like the creation of Eve, which is, again, as I said, the middle of the story. It's the middle painting. Or God... Uh, I think that's God creating uh, light and dark, or the separating the earth from the water. Um, those are, so it's 8 by 15 is the big one, and the small ones are 6 by 8, okay? Now, what's interesting is, do you notice all the architecture? The architecture which is continuing the idea of the architecture down below that 6 is the fourth put in, that, that the Pope's uncle had put in to delimit the room and that relates to the window. So still, there's an idea about the windows, which are these uh, lunettes and pointed uh, vaults are the windows. That's where the windows are. We're seeing three windows here. That's where the big paintings are, okay? Now, I don't think that there's necessarily a meaning to big and small. There might be, uh, because I think he, he has nine. He wants the creation of Eve in the middle. It's not that he wants her small, but he wants her in the middle. Why? What is the name of this chapel? What's it dedicated to? The Assumption. It's dedicated to Mary being bodily lifted up into heaven. So the center of this room is Mary, and Eve, Mary is the new Eve. Okay? But uh, at any rate, he wants to get as many stories in here as possible. Um, he doesn't want to go simple. He wants to go complex. And so he needs the architecture to do that. And so he, he puts the main... In the larger images above the windows, and then he makes the ones in between a little smaller. We call these um, uh, like a baby rack. I'm sorry, these are ribs. Sorry, these are all ribs. And you see cornices here, right? Cornices here. And it's all ceiling, right? So we have architecture going up the ceiling that looks like it's on the wall, and so on. And they help to frame the the uh, figures. Okay, this is kind of a close up of one of the uh, it was the drunkenness of Noah. And one of the prophets, I can actually read this myself. Joel. And who's the other guy? Woman, the Sybil. One of the Delphic Sybils or somebody. I love the Sybils. Um, and you see the architecture. You see the thrones that they're sitting on. You see the pedestals. You see the Gnudi, who are the young men, who are all different shapes. And there's a lot of debate about what they symbolize. Or they're just, you know, they're just caretakers. They're just Stand-ins, um, the beauty of the you know creation of the human form and so on. Right. Now, I've tried to argue that there's there's a there's an architecture down below, and Michelangelo continues that idea up into the ceiling. That's my argument, okay? And it's worth knowing that. So on the left, uh, I know this is not so good. Maybe we should bring down the lights a little bit, can we? Or do we really have to see my face? 
Can you bring down the lights a little bit? Because it's really hard to see these. Yeah, that's better. Oh, that's so much better. Is it? Is it better? Yeah. All right, good, 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 good. Okay, who cares about my face? Um, that's fine, I can move. I, um, but anyway, do you know what this is? Yeah, the rude screen. So this is the marble rude screen with beautiful carving in it. It has a grill. And this is what, this uh, uh, defines the sanctuary or the, uh, or the presbytery. Um, so you see this, you see the, you see the, you see the columns, the square columns, and you see the painted columns on the wall. So we have real columns here. We have the painted columns next to the tapestries. We have the painted columns next to the life of Christ and Moses. And we have a real cornice and a, a real, part of a real cornice here. So there's fictive and real. You see that? Painted and non. Trompe l'oeil, faux, you can use all those words. We have real and faux, whatever you prefer. A lot of them are French, I don't know why it's French again. Use all the words for fake with the French, but faux or trompe l'oeil, fool the eye. Uh, I personally love all this stuff. I love trompe l'oeil and faux stuff. I do it all the time in my architecture because it's cheaper. But at any rate, um, and that's what the Pope was all worried about, right? That's what this is all about, saving money. Um, but at any rate, so we have, we have fictive architecture, we have real architecture, and then we have Michelangelo's architecture on the ceiling. So here we come up, if you follow this all the way up, you get up to this, which is real, a real pilaster. Look at that, a real cornice, real pilaster, with the painted uh, niches with the popes. And then you come up to this pendentive, and the... Um, look at that. Um, and for Rome. That's what I'm trying to get at there. And uh, I love these, right? This is like the, the focus of your show, isn't it? Or one of the foci? These sibyls, aren't they amazing? Um, these are all uh, women that uh, told, gave prophecies that were uh, later understood by Christians to foretell the coming of Christ. And uh, they're all uh, magnificent. Uh, women and beautifully painted. Um, but you can see they're surrounded by this architecture, um, this, this or this furniture, and uh, very inventive furniture. Now, if we start with the kind of the bottom portion, there there's just kind of a pedestal, kind of a pedestal uh, that supports these uh, puti or caryatids that are holding up the cornice, and we have a relation to the pedestal at the root screen. And then as we go in a little further, we do find these wonderful puti that are holding up, the, that are standing on the pedestals. We have a memory. This is, you know, this is Michelangelo, Julius II, and this is uh, with um, Sixtus IV. And you see that same idea. So these, these ideas continue, right? They carry up into the ceiling. And then uh, this is a fun one. This is the... Um, uh, the Coro uh, Sistina, or the Capella Castina, Sistina, and their balustrade. Now, a balustrade is a very interesting thing. It's a Renaissance invention. It's a Renaissance invention. What were these shapes used for before the Renaissance? What were they used? The ancient Romans had things that looked like this. Do you know what they were used for? Shape, and what do you put on top of it? Yeah, light. What? Candlesticks, yes. So the Renaissance took the candlestick idea from ancient Rome, or, or candlestick, or some other kind of, you know, bowl with flaming, you know, hot rum punch or something, and they 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 turn that into a uh, a railing, and so this wonderful balustrade uh, at the Sistine Chapel, and for the choir, which is a large choir, I said to fit in that little tiny room, and then, um, but here's a real candlestick up here. I don't know if you can see that, but on top of the root screen, we have the balusters and the balusters. These are balusters to keep you safe. These are the balusters that hold the candles. Originally six, later eight candles. The Sistine Chapel on the, on the root screen. Okay, and then Michelangelo's little balusters on either side of this Delphic Sibyl. Right? So he's taking elements from the building that's already there. He's the prince of artists. He's the most inventive guy who's ever lived. And he's connecting to what's there. 
He's doing something new. He's doing something original, but he's also connecting to what's there. And just these little, it's, it's actually kind of, uh, kind of wild to do a pedestal or the bench of a seat and put little balusters there. It's kind of crazy. But he gets away with it because it's Michelangelo. Um, the other thing I like to point out, there's all kinds of other connections to Michelangelo's work here, but archi since I'm an architect, I can't talk about the art, I can only talk about the architecture. Uh, the altar, the altars in Florence were often done this way. They were a slab of marble with balusters. And Michelangelo took that idea when he did the second Medici sacristy, the new sacristy. And he took that same idea of an altar with a baluster. So it's it's columnar kind of table uh, altar. Anyway, so he's he's drawing upon uh, these different parts. Now, one of the things that's a very architectural thing is we talked about lunettes are the areas above the windows. Um, and these can also be called lunettes, these triangular things right above the windows, the lunette, the, the area. It's like a half moon. The half moon above the window is a lunette. Now, when you get to the corner, we have two windows, originally. We have two windows. We have a window on this wall, a window on this wall. We have two lunettes intersecting. So that's something that's already there with Sixtus. But Michelangelo wants to make a bigger uh, canvas for his fresco. And so he makes them into one lunette. So instead, originally, you would have had a lunette and a lunette divided in half. He makes them into one lunette. And then he uses the middle part, which is the pendant, which holds up the ceiling. And he uses that. These are all kind of relations to, um, the, uh, to uh, Christ figures. This is um, Jonah. And do you know why anybody would think of Jonah as a Christ figure? Three days in the belly of the whale yeah, in Lake Michigan. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so... So uh, he's also finding a way with the paint and the architecture to make new new shapes that allow him to tell the story. In the end, the end, it's all about telling the story. Um, the architecture is there to help uh, define or compose the story, and then the artist with the figures and the landscapes and so on is telling the story. And then there's some shields and medallions. That's the Della Rovere coat of arms from 664. Very similar coat of arms for... Julius II, and then um, uh, again, this is the uh, uh, a reconstruction of the original high altar and the um, the uh, end wall. Um, so originally, we had Perugino's altarpiece of the Assumption, and. Uh, be below the nativity and the finding of Moses. This is very different than our experience today. Michelangelo's fresco of the Last Judgment has taken up the whole wall, obliterating the three architectural cornices, a couple of pilasters, the image of the Assumption on the first level, which was a fresco in a piece of stone, a stone, a stone frame, Say that. Yeah, the image of the assumption on the first level, the nativity and finding of Moses on the second level, two windows and four popes on the third level, including the center images probably, we think, of Peter and Paul or Peter and Christ. All of that was obliterated by Michelangelo. So one thing that's very interesting about this chapel is to realize that originally, it's a very simple room, originally it kind of continued all the way around. Right? These cornices went all the way around. The stories started at the altar, went around. You know, it didn't go around, but they went to front and back. And with Leo X Medici and the second time Michelangelo returned to Rome because he needed the money, they, you know, obliterated it with the Last Judgment. Right? Kind of amazing. So it, it's worth knowing that the room was originally intended to be different. I'm not saying it's a, not an improvement. I prefer nude people as well. But, um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, but no, I mean, it's it's an amazing thing. Um, pretty striking, uh, you've already heard this in your other talks, but pretty striking is a last judgment on the altar rail, on the altar wall. 
pretty striking. Uh, but it's uh, uh, but there you see there you see some of the story and the need. Oh, I didn't say this. Michelangelo had painted those upper lunettes. He destroyed his own paintings to do the Last Judgment. That's interesting. So, I mean, it's one thing to take out Perugino or, you know, Raphael, what the heck, there's kind of second-rate guys. But to take out your own work, that's really, that's pretty, that's pretty gutsy. But mm -hmm. anyway. Um, now, what's interesting about all of that is we look at it today, you know, it's The Last Judgment, it's a huge, almost 60 foot tall painting by 44 feet wide and it's magnificent over the top um, only took him four or five years uh, seven years to paint um, and um, has the damned in there of course and um, uh, but what's interesting to know is that up until the mid 20th century there was always in front of the uh, Sistine Altar the Last Judgment, there was a large altarpiece in front of the fresco by Michelangelo. Remember that earlier altarpiece by uh, Perugino of the Assumption? This was an altarpiece, I believe, that was a tapestry and could be changed depending on the feast day. Pope's in there 40 times a year or whatever. It could be changed uh, for the feast day. So you have a magnificent altar, you have a magnificent tapestry, and you block out some of the most, uh, the more dicey parts of the Last Judgment. Um, but that was ended in the 40s, I believe, and now we, you know, so we could see the Last Judgment more easily. Um, so what can I say to conclude? Um, the importance of the existing architecture, both real and fictive, to Michelangelo's composition of the ceiling, where the prince of artists added more architecture, more art, and made the room even more intense. The architecture, both fictive and real, are the frames and the supporting actors for the main narrative, which is the creation and fall of the world, the redemption in Christ, and the founding of the church, which continues to work until the last judgment. Thank you very much. So anyone uh, want to dispute with my dates or with uh, any comments or questions? Don't ask me which Sybil is which, but I like them all. The profits aren't bad either. Yes? Yeah, so the, one of the problems of, fre one of the great things about fresco is it's permanent. One of the bad things about fresco is it's permanent until you, just, until you put something over it. So in order, in fact, in order to do a fresco, you have to uh, go into the wall and create a series of little holes to put the new, fre the new plaster to grab into it. Where you've got to, they take a hammer. We just did this at my house. We take the kids, busted a wall. No, we did some plaster work. You know, you bust into the wall in order to key, to key. It's the thing we used to use to turn cars on too in the old days, but a key um, to, to put the plaster to attach, right? So by definition, if you're going to fresco that wall, it's going to be gone. Now today, if we were doing it today, we would find a way to take it apart and put it on something and move it into a museum and charge you money to see it. But it's, it wasn't the, and, it, and these paintings were only uh, uh, Perugino Company, they were in 1483 and this is uh, 1434, so it's, it's only 50 years ago. So it's like kind of modern, it's like, it's like they just did it. So it wasn't like an old thing, you know. No, it's sad, it's sad, but uh, that was kind of, that's kind of the nature of fresco. One of the reasons what we invented oil paintings and paintings on frames as you can move them around. We love that. Other thoughts? Yes, sir. Which part? So Michelangelo's ceiling was done very quickly, about four years, very fast. Uh, he had a lot of helpers. There's some debate that they may have left at some point. 
Uh, he didn't like their bad breath or they weren't uh, working hard enough or whatever. Uh, and then I believe that the last judgment was seven years, but that was um, 20 years later, 20, 20 something, 25 years later. So he comes back. And of course, things have been going on. So, you know, you have, you have, you have Perugino and Botticelli and Signorelli and the other guy um, doing the lower paintings and the guy doing the ceiling. And then you, in the 1480, and then Michelangelo 25 years later. And then you have Raphael and the fabrics uh, after that point. Uh, and then you have Michelangelo returning. 25 years later. So like every every 15, 20 years, they did something. And uh, I'm hoping they're going to do more of it. It just, it needs more art. It needs some more, no, it needs more architecture. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, um, as you're talking about the various proportions of the chapel, I was listening for any reference to the ratio, golden rectangle ratio. And, does that have any application to what's going on here, or is that something that Michelangelo just didn't pay attention to? Yes, it depends if you are a, uh, what's it called, a, um, what's the word in, um, in um, Reformed theology, if you're a, a what's it called, a third millennium, or what is it called? Yeah, are you a free millennialist or not, or a mason, or, you know, what you are? No, uh, it has to do with your beliefs. Um, I looked into this uh, years ago. Uh, specifically on the Sistine Chapel because there's a whole myth about it being based on that great temple in um, Jerusalem uh, built by uh, the guy who starts with an S, I forget his name. Um, and, uh, and, and so there's all these theories, there's all these fun theories about the, the symbolism behind it. And I can't find any evidence that there was any knowledge or interest in a chapel based on the Temple of Solomon, or, uh, which is what people claim, or on the Golden Section at this time. Generally, the Renaissance was more interested in um, ratios that were, uh, come on, scientists, that were um, simple ratios, one to three, two to three, um, Four to, four to five, they weren't looking at irrational numbers, which is the golden section. And um, there were some irrational numbers that they used. The square root of two is an easy one because you take, uh, you take a square and you take the diagonal and you, you know, you can, it's, it's all about like doing things on, a, on the floor, like you want to figure out the dimension of the floor, you take a square and you add, you know, an arc. But uh, yeah, the golden section was not part of his repertoire, um, at least that we know of. So if you're a true believer in this stuff, you'll say, yeah, but he, he didn't know, or there was this, uh, there was this, uh, there was this um, hunchback from France that came over that taught him this stuff. I mean, you can believe all that stuff. There's all that fun stuff. Uh, Victor Hugo writes about this, I think, but anyway. So last sorry about that. Last question. Let's give it up. Thank you.